Welcome to the What's Your Truth podcast, the show that not only showcases the best of independent artists, but also explores what inspires them, what drives them, and what they consider their fundamental purpose as an artist to be. With me today is John Henry Soto. John is a multi-talented multimedia artist hailing from Bayonne, New Jersey, and most recently residing in Nashville, Tennessee. Where to start with John? Well, first of all, he's one of the sickest, tastiest guitarists I've ever seen. A true master of musical intention, including the creation of space and the capturing of the true communication of any song he plays, the way John pulls emotion out of each note he plays is akin to the completeness with which a dog who hasn't eaten in a week sucks every last bit of marrow out of a soup bone, drawing every last bit of soul from a piece and sonically impressing it on your ears and your mind. You like that, John? Wow. I'm not even done yet. <laughs> Beyond this, John is an actor and a comedian and also co-hosts The Counterpart Show, where he and co-host George Batista pick the brains of the likes of Steve Smith of Journey, Dave Sanctious of the E Street Band, and so many more. According to John, although music was his first love, he has always had a deep fascination with making films. He studied with renowned theater and film coach Ruth Cullerman, and he's had films in the Asian American Film Festival, the New Filmmaker Festival, and his film En Route, took first place in the Milford, Connecticut Film Festival a couple of years ago. His film, And On That Day, was a semifinalist in the Nashville Independent Film Festival as well as the Phoenix Shorts Film Festival, and he also acted in the film Down and Across, which was accepted into the prestigious Cannes Film Festival. The other thing to know about John is that he is one of the warmest, most genuine people you will ever meet, ever supportive of the arts and artists. He's simply one of the coolest people on the planet, and it's an honor to have him on the show, ladies and gentlemen, John Henry Soto. Wow, thank you so much, Johnny. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> Moo. I was like, who who is he talking about? <laughs> I don't know that guy. <laughs> yeah, so uh That's here awesome. we are, John. Thank We've you, uh, I feel, in many ways I feel like we're past due to to have the conversation we're about to have. We've been uh aware of each other for a long time. Absolutely. You, Absolutely. You bought some of my music and I've listened, been watching your music and listening to your music, so we're mutual patronizers of each other in a good way absolutely absolutely yeah and you're, you're an amazing guitar player and what you know the the a tremendous compliment coming from you i really appreciate that and great singer as well and just songs i have your records and it's really great so thank you so much right on man thank you well cool well, let's get into it shall we yeah let's do it very good so the first question i have for you is how did you decide that you wanted to become a musician how did i decide well and when I was uh, when I was five years old, my uh, my great grandma came to the house, and my when, you know in a Puerto Rican family, when your great grandma comes to the house, it's sort of like the queen, right? So we had to get the 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 rocking chair reupholstered, and everything had to be set, and the food and all that. So I remember she came in and she sat in her rocking chair, and she was sitting in the middle of the living room, people all around her. She was, I think, maybe like ninety something at that point, and she called me over. I was like five. I mean, I'm I'm short to begin with, and I remember the rocking chair, the the actual handles were like to here to me. You know, she mm -hmm. called me over. She said, "Come here," and she said, "Let me see your hand." And she was, she said, "You know, you're gonna be a guitar player." She said at that age, and I was like, "Really?" She said, "Yeah, you're gonna be a guitar player. I can I see that that's what you're gonna be." And I was like, "I never really thought. I mean, I thought about it, but it wasn't anything." But I remember when I was, uh, but then I got really obsessed with music, just listening to music. It was like, and you know how it is. It it's an obsession that it you don't even you you know you're not even aware of it. You're just you know that every single day you're listening to music, a ton of it, and you're discovering a lot of music. And um, I took a, a shoebox strip, you know, a shoebox, and I put rubber bands around it, and I started kind of doing that. And my grandfather was was like, okay, you know what? We're probably gonna have to get him something. So at the age of nine, he took me to the. Uh, to uh, the guitar store we had it in the Bronx there where I was raised and uh, he bought me his classical guitar and it, I didn't I mean I, I, I all my uncles used to play so they taught me some chords and uh, I have a lot of stories about that you know playing playing with them and in different situations uh, you know holidays was big and um, but I didn't really take in take to it till I was probably around 15. 16 was like this is all i want i really want to do this and it was in my head and and i took uh my brother my little brother he was a little younger than me and I, I said can you come with me i want to go to the thrift store somewhere 
and we went to this uh it wasn't even a thrift store it was like a pawn shop and we were driving by always on the bus and i would always see these guitars on the window so i went in and i bought a 60 dollar uh beat up you know uh not beat up but it was not great uh acoustic guitar steel string and that's what i learned to play on you know and and it was really during that time that i really just got so into it and you know it was a different era right we didn't have youtube you know right. I, had, I had a library that i had to go get books out of and then learn the chords and copy them down and and figure that out and it was right around that age that i really wanted to do it uh, and then that just kept it just i don't know if it was a day where i said yeah i want to become you know but it was i knew i was obsessed with the me with, with the instrument and with music and with trying to create something so it was right around that time right on that's awesome and yeah I, I, you know i feel like every musician has stories like that like i have a story like with my dad and like just with an old guitar an old instrument a hand-me-down something that's such a that's such a common thread with a lot of artists yeah. and there's something beautiful about that actually it's uh, almost like in a way a passing of a torch isn't it it's so beautiful i mean we, we're we're missing so much nostalgia right now with that technology it just takes away so much of like the beauty of the stories and the you know it's like now you'll get a pop-up ad like right now you and i are talking about guitars well i mm -hmm. guarantee you when we go to our facebook pages where there's going to be guitars on both sides of our, you know, our, and emails and all that stuff. It's just the way it is, you know, and there's just something beautiful about finding it with, without that, just spiritually. Yeah. Like you were led to it, not someone fed it to you via some marketing right. channel. No, a hundred percent. I totally right. agree with that. Yeah. Love it. So I think you kind of answered this, but just to make sure I'm going to ask this question anyway. So what was the first experience you remember having with music, like at all with music? Well, right around that that time, I mean, maybe a little older after maybe I was maybe six, seven years old. My uncles, like I said, played and one of my uncles came to the house and he put his guitar on, on the bed <clears throat> on my, my grandparents bed. And I remember going in there and unlatching it and I opened it up and I just ran my fingers through the strings and it was like really it was like this. I made this noise. I was like, what the hell just happened? I was like, whoa, that was awesome. And my uncle came in and he was like, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, you know, and he caught me and stuff. And he was like, but he was, you know, my uncles were all great. And my family was really supportive. He showed me my, my first chords, you know, as I, when I got older. But that was really the first time that I, uh, that it affected me. Like something that I touched made a sound that was pretty, you know, yeah. I was in tune, you know, I've had, had it been untuned, who knows, you know, but, but it was <laughs> perfectly perfectly in tuned um but yeah it was great you know so i don't know if that answers it but i think that's no that's a great answer and again that's that's a yeah. beautiful answer mm -hmm. so who are the biggest influences on your work and why on my work you know i grew up in the south bronx right so in the south bronx there was not a lot of blues and jazz guys hanging around we were listening to uh you know, pop radio stuff and then hip hop, of course, and or what we called rap back then mm -hmm. came out. And that was a big influence on me, rap music in the beginning stages. I loved it. But it wasn't until I heard uh, and, and we had a lot of music and, you know, Spanish music, you know, so I would listen to Tito Puente and Tito Rodriguez and, and all these uh, Spanish uh, um, Jose Feliciano, who kind of was crossing over back mm -hmm. and forth and stuff. But it wasn't until I heard Santana. Uh, mm -hmm. when I was, I don't know, maybe 12, maybe years old or something that I was like, what is that? Like, I didn't, the warmness of, you know, the warmness of those notes was something that it was like butter. And it was, I, I remember, I mean, I could say, I still get like goosebumps just like thinking about it. Cause I remember just being like, so amazingly touched by the, by the, the, the power behind it the energy behind it the spirituality behind it you know i mean not to sound so cheesy but i'm a cheesy guy i don't really give a crap but uh, <laughs> you know i i just was like blown away by that and that's when i wanted you know I, I found out who he was and and then i you know again we didn't have internet right so it was like you just had to turn on the radio and find the station and hope that they play some santana music and, you know, and then go out and try to find some records back then, you know, records and cassettes mm -hmm. and whatever. But he that was really the first, uh, the big influence, you know. And then later on, 
you know, I started listening in, in New York. We had a uh, Scott Muni was the, the big radio. He was on classic radio, you know, Scott Muni 102.7, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I would listen to him religiously. And through that, I, I, you know, I heard, you know, Eric Clapton and Stevie Ray Vaughan became a huge, huge influence. And, and it, that just kind of snowballed um, at that point. But that, that, you know, Santana was the one that kind of, because it was Spanish, so, you know, it was, you know, he's very, very Latin fusion, Afro Cuban music, all yeah. fused together. It was, it kind of infiltrated my, my life and, or, you know, my environment because Oye Como Va was a Tito Puente song, which he oh, covered. Right. Yeah. 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 So he covered it. And that, that was that, that kind of introduced me to, uh, to that, you know, and to a bunch of other guitar players, you know. Right on. Yeah. And he's, it's funny because I've, you know, it's my experience. Like there's like two kinds of like guitarists as far as like even guys like you and I go, like there's people that are really into like the super technical stuff, like sweet picking and all that stuff. And there's the guys that are into like the really emotional, soulful, like feel every note playing. And I've always been more the second, like Slash is my favorite. Santana is one of my favorites. Yeah. And those guys where they just, you feel every note they play. Yeah. You I know? love that. The sustain, you know, I'm a big sustain guy. I mean, we just lost Jeff Beck, who I was a big, big, big uh, fan of as well. Mm -hmm. And um, he had a combination of both. He did. Right. Because he was like, he, he wasn't any other. There's no guitar player like Jeff Beck. You can't say that he plays like anyone. Right. Um, it was his own creation. But um, yeah, the emotional stuff for me was always, you know, Gary Moore. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, now, and today, you know, Joe Bonamassa is like incredible with, you know, yeah. how, what he does. And um, uh, Robin Ford also, you know, there's just so many that have that 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 they really you know and that's another thing you know that you don't have to hit a billion notes nope. you know like I, I you know now with the internet and and you know you go on instagram and you see these 10 year olds like doing van halen eruption note for note you know and it's it's impressive technically you know i so i'm not not to take anything away from the technical ability but you know there's a it becomes a novelty act at at some point and and, and the emotions of it, you know, again, you know, it's, it's hard for to, to talk about this because it's not like I'm, I don't want to take anyone's art away or say that it's, no, 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 no. you know, but there's something about BB King hitting one note. Yes. And everyone falling out of it. You know what I mean? Then to have someone hit 3000 notes in, you know, in, in a measure. Um, and that, that's to me is, uh, it's always been a big part of my, my playing. Right on, man. That's awesome. Yeah. So what's the weirdest thing that's ever inspired you? The weirdest thing? Yep. Well, PBS, and I, I talk about this sometimes because PBS, uh, was sort of a, a thing when I was born, it kind of came around that time and, you know, everybody was talking about it as educational television. So my grandmother, you know, didn't speak English and she thought, okay, well, you know, my grandpa as well. And uh, they put me in front of PBS all the time. Like, I, that's all I watched. So Mr. Rogers was sort of like my dad and Sesame Street and all that. But, of course, they would leave me there too long. And then, like, you had Wall Street Week. And so I learned all this political stuff, too. But mm -hmm. that was just a fluke. But um, we had, you know, at night, I would watch again. I would start watching PBS. And it was the first time that I ever saw Jimi Hendrix was on PBS. Really? First time I ever actually saw him, what he looked like. I had no idea listening to the, to, you know, uh, 102.7 and, and listening to, uh, to all that never knew what he looked like. Cause there was no, you know, we didn't have money growing up, so I couldn't go buy magazine, guitar magazines or anything. <clears throat> television didn't really show Jimi Hendrix, you know what I mean? Like regular television. Um, but there was this documentary that aired on PBS and it was uh, from 1972 and he died in 70. So it was like a fresh documentary where you got to see a lot of the people that were actually with him. And it was the yeah. first time I saw him and I was so blown away. It was so weird though, because it was like PBS, you know, <laughs> how did that happen? But it was, um, I saw Bruce Springsteen there for the first time. I saw Crosby, Stills and Nash. I saw Peter, Paul and Mary, uh, you know, just a lot of different artists that PBS would have these uh, these drives and they would show these uh, these shows. 
And um, so that that was probably the, the weirdest <laughs> place to kind of get influenced by by someone. <laughs> Wow. PBS. Yeah, that's so that is really random, but that's cool though, man. I mean, yeah. hey, apparently PBS had it going on back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what's going on with PBS today, but um, you know, back then they were they were they were kicking it. Mr. Oh, yeah, Rogers man. for me was like awesome. No, I know. I grew up Mr. Rogers, Sesame Street. I grew up on all the same stuff. So I'm yeah, yeah. I was the same kid. Though yeah. I never saw I never saw Hendrix or anything else like that on PBS, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> so how has your art influenced other people? You have to ask other people, I guess. Um, well, from your perspective. I mean, from my perspective, you know, I'm I'm blessed that I do have, you know, really great uh, friends and people that follow my stuff who actually reach out to me. And, and, and um, I get really nice messages, you know, from people. Um, I help. I do, you know, a lot of um, I'll do a Zoom call with people, you know, if they need help with anything. Um, so. You know, I think what influences um, the most about what I do to others, I think, is the fact that I, you know, I, I don't live my life thinking that I want to do one thing or I, I live my life being creative. So, like, I have a family, you know, I'm a social media uh, manager. I, um, I do my own social media. I have my show. I have my films. I got my music. You know, I don't. So, so people will sometimes be like, "Oh, I already have time to do all that stuff." It's not really that crazy because you're passionate about it, and you get up. I get up early, and I I just work towards things that I enjoy doing. So I think that influences people a lot. And people, I just had a call yesterday with a really good friend of mine who called me up and wanted to pick my brain on a podcast that he's launching and some other things. And um, that you know, and I'm always accessible for that. If people want to reach out to me for any questions and stuff. I'm always available i'll schedule time and 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 try to figure it out so i i hope that that the biggest influence that i can have is that you know if you feel it then do it you know if you're passionate about it do it don't wait for anyone's permission don't wait for the time to be right i guarantee you it will never be right if you want to do it you have to do it at that moment and if it's random, you know, because you know, that's another thing that sometimes people go, well, you got to pick one thing, you know, and really focus on that. And I'm, mm -hmm. there's certain truth to that in some ways. But at the same time, that's not really who I am. I, 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 I like to play music and I like to write films and I like to act if I, if I get something that's, uh, that fits. Um, I like to do social media. I like to do these. I like to do my show, a counterparts. And so, and I, I did those things, not because I, someone advised me because I felt that. So if you feel it, yeah. do it. That is incredible advice. And I also, the one thing you said that I just really want to acknowledge, and I kind of touched on in the intro is that, you know, along with being an incredible artist, what you are, you really are like, you get the community aspect of it too. It's not like nobody here gets out on their own. Right. No. And it really is something where I've witnessed this over the years and it seems like, you know, the social media explosion on the one hand has been cool because it's led to a lot of collaboration, but I've also seen a lot more of like the cutthroat com competitive stuff among artists, you know, and it's, I've never understood that. And it really is cool to, that you get that and you get yeah. the community of it and you're actually just willing and there to help people that need help. And it's a really, it's a give and take world and the arts, like it, it's really a team sport, you know? 100%. I mean, you have to, I mean, gosh. I can't imagine like some, uh, an artist, uh, first of all, I love artists, right? So whenever I'm anywhere, it doesn't matter if I see, if I hear live music playing anywhere, I'm going to go and I don't care if they're playing Bon Jovi, living on a prayer. And, you know, like here in Nashville, that's like a big song that everyone, you oh, know, really? it's played everywhere and all the bars, you know, the, the bands, I don't care. I, I want to hear it. I want to hear the musicians. I want to see them. You know, I just love artists. So I think, being there for an artist is really the most important thing that you can do as an artist, you know, because we're, you're right. We're all in this together. You know, it's like, and together we can really, really influence uh, many people and, and then help each other. You know, not, I don't have all the answers and sometimes I'll talk to somebody and they'll help me out in one area. And if I can help the other guy out in, in that area that he needs help in, well, 
man, that's like the best of all worlds, you know? hundred percent. I think that's the other thing that's, God, you're, you are just throwing down the nuggets of gold here, man. Cause that's the other thing too, is like, there's also these guys that are afraid to admit they don't know something and they're not at the wow. top of their game. That's like, dude, I mean, there are guys at the top of their game that don't even consider their topic. And they like Billy Sheehan practices, like, I don't know how many hours a day and he's the best rock bass player on the freaking planet. Right. Right. And yeah. you know what I mean? So it's, there's a humbling aspect too, that I think also a lot of guys, especially the younger guys, they just really miss, you know? Yeah. And, I, and, you know, just to, to, uh, talk a little bit about that, you know, the, you mentioned also social media and stuff, you know, because I, I think what happens with social media and I work in that, in that space, you know, and you, I use it as a tool, I use it as a communication, you know, but what I see is everyone now is sort of a celebrity in their little, their little box, you know, yeah, right. and, um, and that can create this false sense of something, even of, even of purpose. You may think that your purpose is, to be in this box and to show something that, you know, and then you might lose sight of what it is that you really want to do or what your goals are because you're getting the likes doing this, but that's not really what you wanted to do. You wanted to do this, you know? Um, yeah. and, and so I see that a lot also with social media and um, that part of it is, is really dangerous. I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm on these platforms enough to see that, the there's a lot of um not aberration i mean there is aberration obviously but totally. there, you know but there's also a lot of sadness um in the idea that this that the social media platform is going to fulfill something and when to really fulfill something you got to put the phone down you got to put everything down and just really be with yourself and really understand what it is that you really want you know, I always have my book here with me. I got my pencil. I'm always writing down ideas and notes and emo and feelings and things. I'm, I'm I'm here. You know what I mean? I'm not out in those. I put myself out there and I'll do silly things out there and I'll put myself playing music or whatever. But that's I use it as a tool. Just just like if I if the printing press was out today and we were back, you know, a couple hundred years ago, I would use that. I would try to get an ad into the printing printing press. That's, same thing I would do, you know, um, except now it's very accessible. We have a pretty powerful tool in our hands, you know, if we use it correctly. So that's one of the things that I'm passionate about, helping artists also use social media to their advantage, where they can actually get their message out there, you know, and expand their their dynamics and stuff. Absolutely. And you're totally right. The purpose, the message is really what matters. And yeah, I think people, you, I'm with you, they get so interiorized into social media as some like... I don't know. It's like, oh, they, it gives people this really strange sense of like, not that people aren't important in their own right, but this weird sense of like self importance and like putting self yeah. on pedestal. Yeah. It's, it's not like wrong to have, to be proud of yourself and to like, you know, be out there and what you're doing, but there's just something you're right. There's some kind of weird aberration that gets attached to that for some reason. It does. Yeah. It's really, it's really interesting. Um, sociological experiment of some site. Yeah. yeah, the last 25 years has been a really weird sociological experience. <laughs> so shifting gears a little bit, do you have any pre-show or pre-studio rituals? Um, I mean, show, you know, it's been a long time since I, I've just started playing with uh, a, a new group recently, um, but I hadn't played for a while. But I remember, well, the one thing... And it wasn't really a pre it was something that I did not do. It was I I, didn't, I never drank Good. like alcohol at all ever before a show. And I never ate a big meal before a show. That was like I I had because I had early on I had experiences, not so much with alcohol, because I've never really been a heavy drinker, but um with food. You know, you oh you're going on stage, so I eat a big meal and then you're on stage and you're like, I think I'm gonna throw up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only two songs in and I think I'm gonna puke. And so that that's happened, you know, so what I do is I make sure that I eat an hour before I have to go on stage so I can get, real, you know, feel relaxed and stuff. Um, I do. A, I always I also used to do a um, <laughs> a little checklist that I had that I wrote on everything that I needed. And I had a tape to my my pedal board and it was like yeah. a final thing. And I would just check it or make sure that I had all my cables. And stuff. You know, it's nothing worse than showing up and you're like, I don't have my good cable. And you're running around asking can you lend me a cable? Um, and so, you know, those things like that, I, I don't really have anything 
you know, I'm so excited to go up and play, you know, um, back in those days when I was we were playing a lot in New York. Um, it was just a matter of making sure that that I can get up there and all the technical stuff is, you know, because this is a we still have to also be in control of the technical parts of it. Right. Even though that's not really where our art is, we use that art artistically to get our sound out, you know, so being in control of that and having really good control of your gear and stuff like that that was something that i always really paid attention to before i before uh, uh i went on stage or left the house or even beautiful that makes total sense yeah. so what risks if any have you personally taken for the sake of your music Ugh. <laughs> man i get that face a lot man i mean <laughs> just doing it alone is like a you know i mean i remember those first I was just telling uh, somebody this story. I think I'm saying my wife, I think, that you know uh, George, who's uh, the co-host of uh, Counterparts with me, he was in my band. He was the drummer of my band. We're cousins, and we grew up together. So he was the first drummer I ever played with. I'm the first guitarist he ever played with. And so, but we would go before we had our band. We would go to like and try to play with other musicians, and we head into Brooklyn and the dark Brooklyn, and we're like, well, you know driving through these dark streets and and you, you have no idea who you're going to meet and you know there's always something see we, we didn't think about it at the time you know in retrospect i'm looking like man what are we crazy it's like <laughs> we're going into like dark brooklyn bad neighborhoods to try to find those, these musicians to play with um mm -hmm. but you know i think the biggest risk you know was always um the people investing in the people you know that you're playing with you know because you you really you know at some point you know you have to decide you know do you want only really nice people do you want great musicians do you want a combination of both well obviously we want a combination of both we want great people and but you have to then be able to pull the plug if something's not working very quickly and i i i, I spent sometimes a little bit too long with, you know, not pulling that Band-Aid off, you know. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't say that I took a, that, I can't even say, everything is a risk. Everything is a risk. You know what I mean? It's like, we, I you don't know. You don't know who you're going to, you don't know that show that you're going to do if you're, you know, I've stepped on my cable before and pulled it out in the middle of, in a solo. I've, mm -hmm. I, I'm like, I, you know, I once went up like this and I hit my glasses and, and you know, but you know you take the risk of just being in front of this is the business of judgment you know what i mean and if you don't have the the the, the cojones right to really get up there and confront yeah. whatever it is then it's going to feel like a much bigger risk you know but if you just say to yourself you know what this is what i have this is what i do and actually i've done this before in, in the mirror like a, like a dork um <laughs> Like if I'm going to an audition back in, in New York, you know, I was auditioning. I'm like, okay, well, okay, they called me, right? They called me. They want to see me. They must have seen something. I'm going to go in and I'm just going to be me and I'm going to try to do the best I can. You know what I mean? And it, <clears throat> But you go in and you lay it on the table. You know, you just lay everything there and, and you risk it. You know, and art, to really be an artist, you know, you have to be able to confront life and confront people and, it's all a risk, man. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, just being willing to be vulnerable and yeah, even just for the sake of experiencing stuff to that, write about it later. I mean, yeah, there's definitely yeah. a lot to that as well. I can totally see that. Yeah, and enjoy the journey. You know what I mean? I mean, I remember even like times when I went on auditions that I knew I was like so bad. I was like, oh my God, this is so embarrassing. Like I left there and I was so embarrassed. But I remember walking to the elevator laughing, you know, like, like, oh man, here's a story that I'm gonna be able right. to tell, you know. And it didn't deter me from going to the next audition. It was just that moment I learned that I need to do, you know, I, I kind of regrouped and I said, okay, I screwed that up. I'm not gonna do that again. And it was a simple thing, you know, a simple mistake that I made, but it it cost me, you know, a Time Warner commercial, right? So those kinds of things can be painful, you know, but um keep going you know and that might sound like a cliche because so many people say that it just keep going don't give up you know but 
it's so true, man. You just have to, whatever happens, you have to just go, okay, that was messy. Let me go shower up, get some, get us some tea and sit down and let, let me regroup and just keep going because you will get there. Yeah, hundred percent. It's just like, and every day just do something, you know, even something small, just to do something to forwards at what you're doing yeah. in some way. So yeah. I, again, that's incredible advice and yeah. definitely an oft overlooked point because probably because it is so simple and cliche, but it's very true. It's hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, and I always say to, you know, the clients and stuff, you know, just move the needle forward every day, a tiny bit, a tiny mm-hmm. bit. You have a list of 30 things. Go look at the, looking at the list to assess it. Could yeah. be, could be moving the needle forward. Maybe you didn't do anything on the list that day, but at least you went, opened it up, and you looked at the list, and you said, "Okay, I could do this. Maybe this weekend." And boom, you did something. Yeah. You know, but just keep yeah. moving forward and keep, uh, you know, keep that needle moving. Absolutely. So, what's the craziest risk you've ever seen another artist take for their craft? Oh, I've heard so many amazing stories. That you know, Steve Harvey has a story that he talks about. Um, that he's told a few times about getting onto the uh, the Apollo. You know, he had a an opportunity to get there, but he had no money, and you know, he was he didn't have anybody to ask. He had not enough money to get to New York, and he called up. They t- he hung up the phone and he heard his beep like he had another message. This was back in the day we had to call your voicemail, so he called his voicemail back again, and there was a an opportunity for a job. Um, to get to get paid so he had to get somewhere so he said just had enough gas money just enough get to get to that one gig so he got to that gig he made that money the guy said if you can stay at one night you get i'll pay you again he stayed two nights just had enough money to go to new york for the audition for the apollo had no place to go he showed up at the apollo during the day when they were like well you can't come in here now the show's at night (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. And but he somehow got his way in, and the guy said, "You could stay upstairs, but don't come down." You know, and and just having that story and hearing him tell that story. If anybody wants to check it out, you can check it out on YouTube. But he gets emotional during that story and stuff. So I mean, I've seen that. You know, our senior hall. I remember slept in his car. You know, and um, in, you know, a lot of uh, and people that I that I know really, they put in. You know, they they risk a lot. You know, you risk a lot to to do this. You know, people have risked relationships and marriages and um you know a lot of things you know you you have to try to find the balance to be a to you know you can be a good person and be responsible for you know for things but at the same time sometimes you you have to just do something that maybe is not going to make a lot of people happy and you know what is it they say the uh the right decisions are not always the popular ones no they are <laughs> definitely I think most of my decisions <laughs> out of uh, on my art and stuff were not fully popular or even understood. You know, like, well, why, why are you going to do that when you are doing that? You know, and I was like, I just feel I have to, <laughs> you know. Well, yeah, and that's the thing is with art, it's your intention, it's your communication. It's really, and that's the other thing too, because you're totally right. It's like doing it. I mean, there are crazy things that people do to maintain it. You know, it strains parts of their life, but. Yeah, that's also almost the acid test of are you meant to be an artist or aren't you? Because when there are the people that are really like artists, they're meant to do it and they can't really do anything else. Right. Yeah. They don't. Yeah. Well, I mean, what can you like, you know, you look at stories like, you know, Elton John. What is Elton John going to do? Right. Other, than, other than be Elton John. You know what I mean? He ain't going to be working, in, you know, like a, as an accountant. Although fun, f- fun story is a side note that that reminded me of was Alan Rickman. Mm. who. Obviously, he was one of the greatest right. British actors right. ever. Yeah. <laughs> Toward the end of his life, there was a stint where he was actually working, and I, he, I think he just did this for fun. He worked for an airline, like at the counter. He literally did that, and it was just—I don't know if that was—he got bored with some with the life or what, but yeah, yeah, he didn't need the money, but he literally did do that. So I guess every well, once in a while, there's someone that does that. But yeah, well, did, didn't Andy Kaufman did did the same thing? He worked at a uh, pantry. He was like he would clean. He kept that job through his whole life. He would go and and um, pick up, ta- clean the tables up at this restaurant. <laughs> he just yeah. always had this job, so I was like, okay, you know. But yeah, those are eccentric people that just want to be part of uh, of life, and they can do it. You know, they can do whatever they want. You know, and and at that point, in that stage of their career, then 
just want to do something interesting. I love that. No, hundred percent. So what's one thing about you that would shock everyone to know? Well, um, sometimes it shocks people. My wife is five ten, and I'm about five nothing. So <laughs> <laughs> that sometimes shocks people when I tell them. Um, I was a, a sort of a sort of a ghetto celebrity with uh, break dancing. I was a I did a lot of break dancing back in those days, and I won a, some contests, and I danced for the mayor and for some other uh, people in the Bronx, you know. So I mean, sometimes that shocks people. Um, not too much. I mean, I'm, I'm especially now with social media, I'm so out there. You know, I, I've told every, not every story, but uh, quite a bit of stories. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and then there's some darker stuff that I don't talk about, like, you know, my growing up and in poverty and stuff like that. That might shock people, but I usually don't really talk about that unless it comes up in a conversation about the subject, you know. Sure. Makes total sense. So what's the one thing or tool that you absolutely cannot live without as an artist and why? Um, well, my guitar. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the, the thing that I've had the most since I was very young. I've always had that. It's always never been... You know, I mean, I've never been in a house that didn't have guitars, <laughs> so I don't, it doesn't even, it, I can't even compute not having that. I do like my little, um, this is kind of cheesy, but I do like my little pads and pencil because I like writing a lot. Yeah. So I'm always with a pen or a pencil or something to write. Um, so I love that. Those are my tools, you know, and if I had a guitar, a pencil and a little booklet, I'm I'm okay. I can live on an island forever, really, as long as there's food there um, and coffee. And right. I think we're good. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's that's I dig that. Yeah, I'm I'm I like I've always been a pen and notebook guy too. Like yeah, I hate, I hate writing on like a laptop. I do it sometimes when I just don't have a choice or when I'm yeah. kind of really fast and don't have a pen. But but, yeah. but like yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm all, I like things I can hold and touch and completely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. scripts I do online because I, I'm on a thing because it's more, it's formatted and all that stuff. Yeah. But when it comes to like songwriting or writing something or uh, it's got to be pen to paper, there's just something about putting it into the physical universe and making it have your hands, your physical body, not have it appear somewhere or in ones and zeros, just put it really down there and see it you know that you wrote that down that was up here and there's just a a, a power to that 100 percent. so what has been the most difficult piece of music for you to create and why you know i've always i, I have trouble in incorporate incorporating more jazz into my playing you know i love jazz and i i could play some chords you know a bunch of chords but it's very it's always been difficult to like really incorporated into what I want to do. You know, I think lately in the last, uh, I don't know, not lately, but the last like 10 years, I would say, I've gotten better at uh, at doing that and adding more of that. It, it almost felt like I was really, I had, you know, when, when you, ignorance sometimes is bliss, right? They say ignorance is bliss. So when I was very young, I knew what the chords, how to play the chords, but I didn't really know what they were. I didn't know where they fit. I didn't know the the science behind it or the, all that. And so I just played them, and it, I wrote a ton of songs that way, which which you know were were songs that I really liked. And then somewhere along the line, I learned, right, which was the biggest mistake I made. I started learning what actually everything fit in and how it all worked, and and then you start going with rules and stuff like that, you know. And now in the last 10 years, through some of my studies, through my, 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 my church and stuff, I've kind of been able to open up myself a little bit more and start being almost more um, native again, you know, to my, to my creativity. And so I'm doing that more now, which is, which is exciting. And I, I like what I'm writing these days. Awesome. And it's interesting. I know what you mean about the jazz stuff. I was actually personally kind of fortunate is I kind of cut my teeth on jazz a little bit, but I never learned it to the degree because I'm like you, like when I got too dialed in the theory, it just kind of became a stop, you know? Yeah. 
But um, yeah. and as the years have gone on, I've just done it more. I just kind of naturally, almost instinctively figured out parts of it anyway. But learning the basic song structure stuff and improvisation and jazz was invaluable, actually. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. That that part of it is really important, and and I mean, I think also, you know, theory is 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 amazing. You know, I mean, yeah. it's a language that's just beautiful, and the things you can create and how it flows. So, I mean. I, I say, if, you know, if you can learn theory, um, do it, you know, um, you know, I know people say, you know, school and all that stuff. I say, no, I say, you know, I say, do it, you know, I say, do it because it's also going to give you right now you have YouTube, you know, and YouTube is giving so many people so much content. Like I follow Rick Beato. I don't know if you know, Rick Beato. I know. Yeah. yeah, so I follow Rick Beato a lot, and and you know he's an educator of theory, and he's a super smart guy. Um, and the way he does it, it kind of makes it very accessible. It's you know what I mean. It's like yeah, you could do this and still be very creative. You don't have to, you know. There's there's these people that are like, I don't do theory. I play by ear. I'm like, well, that's cool too. You know what I mean? I mean, some of the greatest of all times did that. You know, right. but I say try to really dive in because the world is changing um playing by ear is 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 okay but there's a lot of people out there that are now learning theory and if you if you can compose that that really can go a long way so i i encourage people to study study and that is a it's a really great viewpoint actually that i don't know if i've ever heard anyone take that viewpoint usually it's the other way where they're like ah, i'm ear trained and that's that's the thing and which is like that's great but you're i, I can see your viewpoint 100 percent. that actually makes a lot of sense yeah i think it's important to be able to to look at what it is that you know that some of these greats like i look at like chick korea right who was uh -huh. the greatest of all time right you know very theory oriented and then billy sheehan we would you know we just mentioned um no theory but right. the greatest of all time the right. bass player you know what i mean like freaking like one of the the the, the greatest of all time you know so um and actually it's I, I was at a workshop with billy sheehan and um, he actually was talking about, I asked a question because I'm, I'm a, so like, so I asked a question, but we were talking about theory, you know, and, and uh, he doesn't, he, he goes, no, I don't, you know, I, I play by, by, by ear. I, I know everything on, I know the, the scales and, I, you know, he's at another level. I'm not, you know, he's just at another level of, of understanding the instrument. But um, one of the things that was fascinating was like, you know, why was theory created? in the first place, you know, and the, you know, he was like, well, the reason was there was no other way to record. If I come up with a piece today, if I'm Mozart and I'm writing something today and tomorrow when I come back, I'm not going to remember what I wrote. I got to figure out a way to document exactly what I just developed so I can come back and read and know exactly what I did with the steps, the, the notes, the, the measures, everything. And so that was why one of the reasons why it was developed, you know, and and why it, be, it became such a such a thing. But there's just such a big scope, you know, that there's so much involved in it. Um, anyway, I can go. I can go on on that one. No, and you're talking about and it is. It's like an entire. I mean, you said it's a language. Like it is a whole other language. Hundred yeah. percent. Amazing. Yeah. So if you were going to write a book about your career up to this point, what would you title it? God. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, looking, I would always say looking up because I'm short. So I was, I would, and so I was always looking up, you know what I mean? Like I just always thought it's always going to get better. You know, I never thought, um, even growing up where I grew up, you know, it can be pretty hopeless in, in that type of environment, you know, poverty and violence and stuff like that and drugs so, you know so when you're surrounded with it it can get pretty pretty dark you know but i was always looking up you know always looking up and i always think about that you know um just looking up at the world you know and that's what i probably what i would just call it that i love that i like that it's like the mentality of choosing your attitude that's such a great message yeah i think so it's important no matter what your environment is for you to decide well I, are you that environment or are you you Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So what are your plans for world domination? <laughs> well, 
Well, me, coffee, and my guitar are going to uh, really, you know, I, I think it's funny. But my uh, counterpart show is is um, really become a, a great vehicle for George and I to really help and entertain a lot of people. Um, and we we really want to have the counterpart show have um an umbrella be an umbrella toward to other different uh, connections so we have counterparts wellness we have counterparts um moving pictures where we talk about film and counterparts music and stuff like that so we we have so that's really going to be the world domination you know and uh you know this year we last season our first season last year we really had an amazing year we had no idea we were going to be interviewing some of the people we did and it was so much fun um, and then this year, we really want to take that to the next level and have just, uh, you know, uh, other team up with other, other, other organizations, which we are scheduling that as well. Um, and that's going to be where, where we really do that, you know, where we really, because it's all about helping people. And I know that with counterparts, I know I can help a lot of artists, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm very understanding of where I am right now in my life. And I have a body of work and I have a lot more coming, but at the same time, I want to help people more than anything. And, you know, especially artists in the inner city, it's a really important thing for me, you know, having been in that environment, you know, if you're a guitar player living in the, in, in, a, in an inner city, inner city, it's really hard, you know, to find others, you know, and so if we can create a place that we can come, you know, a safe place, that's really important to me. So that's something that it's all built into what we're working on to take over the world. I love that. And just as a note, I can't remember if I told you this or not, but your podcast was one of the inspirations behind me doing this podcast and really? for various reasons to help. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really. Wow. You know, this was a podcast I'd want to do a few years ago and then life just kind of got busy and I'd kind of put it aside a few years ago and forgot about it. And then I saw you doing, I saw one of your episodes of counterparts and I remembered this and I was like, that's what I want to be doing is something, you know, not, a, not a carbon copy of you because you're you, no, but no, yeah. I, have my, I am having my own concept of like how to help other artists via what I'm doing with this podcast. So I really thank you for doing that because oh. it, impa it impacted me, man. That and is, it's, you're the reason I'm here right now. That is so awesome. Thank you for telling so, me uh, that. That's awesome. Back to that question of how your art has influenced others. Well, here's one example. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and on that. So last question. And again, the show, obviously is not only showcasing independent artists, it's also exploring what inspires them, what drives them and what they consider their fundamental purpose as an artist to be. So John, what's your truth? You know, my truth is, is really sincerity on not just music and, but, but as a person, you know, like if you, if I meet, if I meet, uh, if, I, if I'm in the grocery store and I'm talking to somebody in the grocery store and um, I go and I'm talking to the president of the United States or the, the you know, the, the king of England, I guess I, I, at this point, um, I'm going to be exactly the same person. You know, I don't change, you know, because I don't feel that that sincerity, you know, who I am and what I want to bring to the table is always going to be exactly what I want to bring to the table at any table that I get invited to, you know, it's not, yeah. doesn't change. So, you know, that, that is my truth. You know, it's, it's really something that, that I, I I've come to realize as I, you know, as I've aged now, I, I see that more than ever, you know, but in the beginning I, I did have that. I just didn't know what that was as I got older and I started learning more about myself I realized, oh, okay, you know what? I've, I've always, I've always just been this guy, and I always talk like this, and I don't, and I'm always very, I'm a really good listener, you know. I think that's what makes the 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 the, the counterpart show work, you know. I, I like to listen to people, you know. I think that's important, and um, yeah, so that's my truth, you know. It's it's just really sincere in what I want to give others, you know. It's. And, and that sometimes gets me in trouble, by the way, you know, like sometimes I like I'm, I'm a guy that will fall in love with someone instantaneously, you know, not romantically, but I would be like, you know, guy, girl, whatever. I see that. I'm like, man, that is an awesome. I want to be friends with that guy. You know, that dude is amazing. He's so happy and he's, he's creating such great music, you know, 
Um, same thing, you know, with a group of, of, of artists, you know, I suddenly want to be involved. And sometimes, you know, that's a little bit like, <laughs> I, I think I, I, I get a little too much and people are, you know, they're like, what's going on with mm-hmm. this guy? You know, I'll, you know, but, but it's, it's actually what gets my guests. You know, I get, I ask guests to be on the show because I see somebody and I'm like, man, that'd be great to talk to this person, you know? And, um, but it is a sincere thing. Like I don't want anything from anyone other than I want to experience that journey, you know, uh, that they're on and I want to understand it, you know? So it's a real, it's sincerity has always been something that I'm, I'm very, that's my truth. That's beautiful, man. And that's, again, that impacted me hearing you say that. That's just, that's awesome. Thank you. That's why I don't even, I don't even know how to, how I could properly acknowledge that because that was a really like, that was a really like next level. That was like a very like philosophically speaking. That's what the hell am I trying? I can't talk all of a sudden. You've made me speechless is what you've done. Cause I don't even, like I said, it's, that's just, that's so fundamental. Yeah. And it is, it's just such a pure truth. You know, it really is. It really is. Especially artists are very vulnerable. You know I mean? We're, we're, yeah. you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm nuts sometimes, you know, it's like, uh, um, you know, we all go through these things, you know? And so when you're dealing with, you know, I have, I'm blessed that I have a good foundation right now through my friends, my church, my, my family, you know, but there's a lot of artists out there that are trying to find their truth and trying to find who they are, you know? And so I think that they, they're cautious sometimes of who they let in and, yeah. and then sometimes and they should be, you know, I mean, artists are magnets for, you know, scumbags, right. You know I mean? It's like, unfortunately, there's a lot of suppression that artists pull in and it's important to stay really focused on that. But also, you know, be aware that you might actually be pushing away somebody that can actually help too. So you have to really stay in, in, in present time and understand that that situation, when you see somebody there that is interested in helping you in some way, ask questions. See, well, what is it, you know, what are you, what's, what's, what do you do? You know, what do you, you know, ask, pull the string on that you find out what's happening. You know, it may be somebody that can really help, you know, and, and that having that balance, I think is really important for artists. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. Wow. Well, I just, I just grew as like a person. Ah. Listen to you here, man. That's, uh, thank you so much for being here. Before we end off, I did, um, Want to take the next 60 seconds and go ahead and plug anything you want, anything John Henry Soto, go. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank, first of all, thank you so much. You're awesome. You're a great listener as well, which is a, a big uh, a big thing. You're going to do fantastic in this. Um, please keep me posted on stuff. If you need guests, I will send you people that, I can, uh, that you can interview that you'll love also. So let's stay in communication on that. And thank Absolutely. you so much for having me on here. Uh, for me right now, you know, our counterparts show is starting up again January 17th, which is on on Tuesday. Uh, we're on every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you can go to counterpartsshow.com. You could download our app that uh, and you can actually watch it on your phone and watch all the other episodes. We're going to do a, our first show is going to be we're going to talk about songs from 1983, which, oh, believe, yeah. It, yeah, believe it or not, it's 40 years ago. Um <laughs> Yeah, I know. It sounds like 40 years ago. I'm like, wait, what? Uh, yeah. So we're going to talk about the, the top 20 songs, and then George and I are going to pick our top five, and we're going to kind of go to battle on, on that. So that should be fun. But that's every Tuesday night. Every Tuesday night, counterpartsshow.com. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Well, John, again, thank you so much for being here, man. It was It's really been an honor. Man, this uh, is my pleasure, man. Anytime. Thank you so much. Right on. So everyone, John Henry Soto, check him out. Uh, Links in the description. We'll see you on the next episode. Peace, y'all. Take care.